First of all, Joe, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to share this with, uh, with everyone else. Um, and congratulations on the, the award of being a giant in agriculture. <laughs> that was uh, truly a well-deserved honor. It, it was. And I appreciate uh, you uh, being here today to, to uh, kind of conduct this interview. So let's kind of uh, lay, lay it out there for everyone. What were some of the places you worked when you started and kind of the timeline that, that, that your career trajectory took uh, during that process, yeah. starting at, well, starting with where you grew up and, and what yeah. you did there? Well, I grew up in Washington County, Mississippi. It's in the Delta region, a lot of row crop agriculture there. We were cotton farmers, basically. And uh, when I was young, we had animals, but not, not, it just wasn't a big cattle producing area or anything. Everybody just had it for their own use or whatever, hogs and stuff like that. But by the time I was nine or 10, we pretty much got out of the animal business and were just farming cotton, wheat, uh, you know, and soybeans, stuff mm -hmm. like that. So, grew up in a farming family, interesting background, that area too. I went to school in Leland, Mississippi, which is uh, where the public school was. A very good public school, I have to admit. I thought I got a good education there, but uh, it, was a, it was a very diverse population too. There were a lot of, uh, a lot of immigrants there. Um, that area had escaped the Civil War, really. I mean, it was kind of settled after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was just imagine a huge river bottom. I mean, one of the biggest you'll ever see, you know, because <laughs> they had huge, uh, I know my grandparents were talking about it. some of the trees that they would log off to get the land ready and stuff were just huge deciduous trees, oaks and hickories and all kind of stuff. But so it was, it was prone to flooding, of course. And, uh, but in the big flood of 27, Drove, drove them out and they came back, you know. So it was, uh, handling water was a, was a big issue. Yeah. So, uh, so grew up in a farming community and like I said, a very diverse uh, population with uh, a lot of immigrants. They were Jews, they were, uh, uh, my, my grandparents were Italians. They had uh, Lebanese Christians, uh, uh, good Southern aristocrats as well as rednecks and, uh, and, and of course a lot of African Americans mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of and most people started off uh, you know being sharecroppers you know and, and finally so raised in agriculture uh, pretty much understood from the very beginning what it's like to be a farmer uh, and that probably influenced a lot of my career because I always thought helping farmers was, was, was what you should do mm -hmm. yeah. I think a lot of us get into it for that reason. For sure. Yeah. For sure. So I went to, uh, from from high school. I went to Mississippi State, and uh, uh, actually went to state because a friend of mine was uh, was uh, was a manager for the football team, and they needed a <laughs> student trainer, and the, the trainer I worked for. So I was you know spent that uh, good part of my career in in the athletic dorm and. <laughs> uh, it was amazing. Yeah, I got to go to all the game, you know, go to places nice. like Baton Rouge and mm -hmm. all those places, and so, so that was good. But uh, finally settled into uh, agronomy, yeah. and uh, really thinking I was going to go back to the farm. But uh, as, as I tell the tell the story, and uh, uh, is uh, my dad called me and said, uh, "Cotton, nineteen cents a pound. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, if you could do something else, it's going to be tough to break into farming, you know, yeah. and I can't carry you." Uh, yeah. you know, for, for raising my own family. So, um, so I decided to go to graduate school. Uh, I had work, worked in the forage and turf program there at Mississippi State under Coleman Ward, who mm -hmm. was running the program. And then he had been my advisor at Mississippi State, and I ended up going to the University of Florida. I was real interested in plant breeding. I'd, I'd done some work with a cotton breeder when I was growing up, and uh, kind of really got into it, and liked genetics from, from the very beginning. Mm -hmm took a course under a guy that was famous at Mississippi State called Chicken Thomas. He was in the poultry <laughs> science department, but taught a great course in genetics. Mm -hmm. And then I took plant breeding at Florida and got into doing a lot of plant breeding work at Florida. Mm -hmm. And uh, then from there, uh, when it was time to graduate, I was very fortunate in those days that you didn't particularly have to do a postdoc if, if your credentials matched the positions. Mm -hmm. And uh, just so happened, the University of Georgia had a 
had a position in plant breeding and forage breeding. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had worked mo all, all my time, undergraduate and, uh, you know, and all the way through my graduate work in the forage program. Mm -hmm. A little bit in turf, but, but mostly forage. So it was a natural fit, and uh, Bill Cobble was the department head in Georgia. And Roger Borman had just come on. He had come on mm -hmm. a couple of years before me. Harold Brown was here. Uh, Elvis Beatty was the was the forage guy. Mm -hmm. Later on, we hired Carl. So that's that's basically how I got to Georgia and mm -hmm. spent my big part of my career at Georgia. Mm -hmm. When I was able to retire, the Noble Foundation asked me to come out and start a new unit for them. So I did, and that was a great, great experience because it was great to work for an mm -hmm. organization that had plenty of resources and being able. And I was quite interested in those days if we could apply the biotechnologies to, to uh, and, yeah. uh, and they had the resources to do that. So mm -hmm. see if we could bring them into the practical plant breeding process. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after I retired there, I came back to Athens to live and be around my grandchildren and children. Mm -hmm. And I started doing some consulting, got a lot of requests to do some consulting, so I still Still today, do some oh, consulting for the seed, mainly for seed companies, but also some international work uh, with in New Zealand where we look at uh, mm -hmm. look look at uh, in reviewing some of their science programs. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so. so the timeline when you graduated from University of Florida, um, what year was that? Nineteen seventy-seven. Seventy-seven. Yeah. So came straight to UGA right. until when did you retire I, at UGA? I re re uh, retired in two thousand four. Two thousand four. And then went to Noble for about 10 years, right? Yeah, it was about 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. And still uh, very active in the five or so years since? Yeah, well, it seems like it. I didn't think I would be doing too much, but uh, <laughs> yeah. but uh, you, you do get a lot of calls sometimes. Well, I know, I certainly see you yeah, around a lot. Yeah, so. yeah, that's right. Well, you, you talked a little bit about where you grew up and, and kind of how that influenced you. Were there other influences there that were on your career and, and what what role did your parents play in kind of setting the trajectory for you? Did they really support your education, or um, were, was this kind of in rebellion against them? Or, or, you know? <laughs> no, no, I, I'd say, uh, so my grandparents, uh, you know, it was a family type operation, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So I had uncles and we would get together and share things, but each person or each entity, each family had its own operation. But as an overall family, so my grandparents were kind of a patriarch matriarch, mm -hmm. and so I had an uncle, I had uncles and aunts, and 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 so we all got together every Sunday, mm -hmm. the whole family. It'd be thirty more people eating <laughs> eating the Sunday dinner after after uh, after uh, after church, mm -hmm. and uh, so so it was. Um, I would say that was very influential. My grandparents were very influential. My parents too, and and I I would say that I had an elder an older cousin who was my mother's oldest sister had had gone to college, mm -hmm. and so she had gone to college, and so the family in those days were thinking, well, if you can go to college, you need to go to college, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. uh, education they knew was was very important. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody recognized it then. And uh, but you know they they really didn't quite understand when I when I got the job at the University of Georgia I told them I was in a professorial well as far as my grandparents and my uncles and everybody thought they the only thing they knew about universities was goodbye Mr. Chips you know where the guy the guy has the mortarboard and he lectures it's an old British system where you you wear the robes in the mortarboard all the time and they just figured that's what I did you know and and so when I would try to explain to them well you know there's a big experiment station here at Stonewall they do research I kind of doing research I mean I do teach classes but you know, you know I could just tell they and finally I just said yeah that's what I do <laughs> so I lecture with a mortarboard and, and up, robes <laughs> up trying to explain it, it was easier it was easier to, <laughs> but but they they were always uh, I think they pushed education and mm -hmm. and uh, and and I think they knew uh, by the time we got in the late 70s you know especially in the late 70s it was tough to make a living in farming mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of people were losing yeah. their land especially in the late 70s yeah. early 80s that was I tough I mean a lot of a lot of my friends who stayed behind they lost the family land mm -hmm. you know because they got leveraged out too far with with debt and mm -hmm. stuff like that so in some ways I was lucky that I chose a profession where you could you know 
my whole background was was farming and agriculture and all everything that goes with it, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, but I didn't have to actually try to make a living because <laughs> it was pretty tough. Yeah, that was a tough era for sure. Yeah, it was. Well, it's farming stuff anyway, but uh, especially yeah. when uh, you're dealing with the external forces that they were dealing with at that time. But but my parents and especially my grandparents, even the extended family. Um, you know, they had a lot of, in, they, it's, it's impossible not to have a lot of influence on you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it was a classic work ethic. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, you just learn that you just go get it yeah. when it's time yeah. to get it. You know, yeah. uh, you just, and if you had to work hard or work late or, or whatever, or whatever because the it. next day could be raining or, yeah. or whatever. So yeah. it was, uh, but you know, I still think today, uh, riding in a combine and harvesting wheat, I, I always felt you know, that, it's just something about that that I yeah. still look at it. You can see the grain going in the hopper. It, it's it's great feeling. Mm -hmm. I, I think about it a lot when I see people on combines. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, these days, so much more uh, goes into that. And, it does. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, not uh, a lot of that has to do with what you did. You know, yeah. not specifically on wheat, but on you know some of the developments of that uh, that you made within the forage industry certainly have been um, legendary. Uh, you know, from grazing type alfalfas mm -hmm. uh, to the work you did with novel endophyte tall fescue, um, Durana white clover, mm -hmm. which has now become one of the more ubiquitous uh, uh, varieties right. of clover, and there's a few others there too that are very, very well uh, distributed. Of, of those things in your career, what would you say you feel like is your your signature accomplishment, or is it kind of like? picking your kids you know which is your favorite <laughs> maybe it's too hard to pick one well you know um, yeah I'd say it was like picking your kids because but it was a little easier too because um, they were both they all three of those things you mentioned were probably the highlights but they were in very unique areas there was some compatibility across them mm -hmm. the main the main things that were made them all compatible was that uh, again getting back to what I mentioned at the beginning is is, is the emphasis on trying to help farmers, mm -hmm. and in this case, livestock farmers. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we knew going in that uh, into my career, when I started my career, that I mean, we had Bermuda grass, we had Bahia grass, and we had tall fescue. And, and that was it. We used a lot of nitrogen fertilizer, and that was the forage system. Well, that was a good system, especially when I used to talk to Glenn Burton, and you know, he used to talk about saw briars and <laughs> when he first came it was uh so just getting bermuda grass into, into there right. was a real step up but but you know in those days you were starting especially after the oil embargo you were starting to see things like nitrogen fertilizer when glenn was 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 working very hard uh mm -hmm. you know, back in the 50s it was a nickel a pound and and it just kept going up and so being able to drive a system with nitrogen wasn't as lucrative as it used to be. And so that was one thing we said, well, we're going to have to work more on legumes. Mm -hmm. And there's always a nutrition problem with these grasses sure. at some time. So mm -hmm. that, that aspect. So that's why we got into alfalfa. That's why we got into clovers was the nitrogen fixation part and, and also the, the quality. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand is one of the main three I mentioned, tall fescue had this tox toxicity problem. Mm -hmm. So we got in, you could you could work on tall fescue. It was a big issue too, uh, mm -hmm. you know, trying to figure out how 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 you could overcome this toxicity problem. Mm -hmm. And the first foray uh, was was of course remove the endophyte, and mm -hmm. that just didn't work too well. In fact, that was a, a real black eye, yeah. you know. And uh, so we knew we had to do something different. So mm -hmm. so those things also range from. A very practical approach, like Durana clover, you mentioned, was just going and collecting escapes, or what we call mm -hmm. uh, ecotypes out there, and you know, doing some breeding on them, making sure you had good seed yield and good stolen density and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But putting them together, and then then everything from the end of fight work to where it was a big team effort, you know. And that was I was lucky to have be on a good team too. Yeah. You know, it, there's a lot of luck in this business, a lot of serendipity. And being able to work with guys like Carl Hovland and Carol Brown and, and Mark McCann, you know, it, and then superintendents like um, like Grady Calvert and and his son uh, mm -hmm. Vaughn Calvert, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was Jim Dobson in those days too up at up at Blairsville, mm -hmm. and 
it, it was it was just really good. Uh, the, the university was just a great place to work. They had a lot of infrastructure. We could do it, and mm -hmm. we we could work as a team. And then that team approach even spreading overseas to the New Zealand group, the Ag Research right. Group, mm -hmm. especially with Gary Latch, uh, just allowed us to just do a lot of stuff in a team environment, in a collaborative environment. Mm -hmm. And I think foragers just lend themselves to that, it, yeah. it, it, more so than anything because... It's almost a necessity, isn't it? It's a necessity because, you know, I, I was always used to tease the grain breeders, you know, they they just produce more grain, you know, right. that's all, they could just <laughs> go after yield, maybe some yield limiting factors like diseases and stuff, but 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 they didn't have to go feed, right. <laughs> they didn't have to do a feeding trial, uh, you know, that, would that grain actually right. be nutritious or whatever, or not toxic in this case. So mm -hmm. it, it was, uh, you know, it was just, you just had to have this team approach. You had to have animal mm -hmm. scientists, nutritionists, even veterinarians involved, you know, in, in something. Well, you know, another thing that I find unique and different about your career and, and the successes that you've had as a breeder, you've used conventional techniques, you've used, um, you know, other types of, of tra uh, traditional techniques, as well as, right. you know, the latter part of your career at, at Noble Foundation was very much involved with the development of the reduced lignin trait in, in alfalfa, for example. Right. So you've kind of run the gambit of that. And, and uh, so I, I, one of the questions I always like to ask of, of scientists that have had that kind of diversity in their career, and what, were there moments of serendipity? In, in other words, you kind of went one direction, but something led you back in another direction. It was a major breakthrough. Yeah, you, you know, uh, in fact, I, I'm a great believer in serendipity. It, it's probably the biggest issue or, you know, chance or luck, but it's being able to make sometimes the right move. Sometimes you're even lucky you made the right move. Mm -hmm. I mean, the alpha graze you uh, mentioned about grazing tolerant mm -hmm. alfalfa, we, we, we thought we'd just do it simply by putting out a lot of germplasm into small paddocks and just grazing the heck out of them, mm -hmm. you know, and we did. But man, there were hardly any plants left. Mm -hmm. There were like 40 or 50 plants in a two acre field. And so, wow. so as a breeder, you start thinking, well, that's, those are escapes. But the serendipity was we just collected them, mm -hmm. you know. I mm -hmm. remember Hovland said, well, you might as well collect them. And Donald Wood, too, he was saying he was my te technical guy. It mm -hmm. was really great to have him the whole career, too. That was very mm -hmm. important. Uh, you know, it was, uh, yeah, let's collect them and put them together. And they became alpha grades. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's just, so you, you could have walked out of that field and not had alpha grades. Or you, if, and then it took everything from then on. Mm -hmm. Uh, same thing with the Durana I mentioned. We just collected ecotypes, but but the uh, but but the, even the one we spent the most scientific approach with, which was the uh, uh, non-toxic endophytes, that took a lot of collaboration, a lot of science, a mm -hmm. lot of. A, but you, it just showed me that you can go any way. You can yeah. go very simply. You can go very complex way. The main thing I think is. Is, is to just have good goals and knowing what needs to be done. Yeah. And uh, I've often tell, I've told my students over the years and I, that the best training I think I got was teaching the forage management course. Mm -hmm. Well, you, rec you, you recognize where all the bottlenecks are. Right. And, right. and can you put something in that bottleneck? And I mentioned earlier about the, the big bottleneck was grasses take a lot of nitrogen mm -hmm. and they're not very high in quality mm -hmm. uh, and also some of them are toxic so mm -hmm. you know if you can overcome those bottlenecks yeah. you know you and can legumes you know, really solve yeah. a lot of those problems you can, yeah. so you know one of the serendipitous events in your career I think too was the the opportunity you had to go over to do a uh, postdoc in in New Zealand or excuse mm -hmm. me not a postdoc but a, uh, uh, a sabbatical right. in New Zealand and spend a little time over there and networking with folks over there and then ultimately connecting with scientists there who were working on uh, novel endophytes and from the Mediterranean region. Tell, tell a little bit of that story. Yeah, you know, uh, so it's almost a, uh, an urban legend now. It's a, <laughs> in the new book on the Wondergrass, it's, a, it's mm -hmm. actually uh, documented in there. Um, and, the, and the legend and the story, and it's 
mostly true. <laughs> Some embellishment probably, but not much. It's 90 something percent true. I was at the International Grassland Congress in, in France, in Nice, France, in the late 80s. And I had just discovered that uh, I had, that we had to have the endophyte in the lower part of the fescue belt mm -hmm. if we were going to keep, keep it in. Because it was all about that time that it was happening that if you didn't have, if you had fungus free, it, it just wouldn't stand up to mm -hmm. the rigors of, you know, the, the climate and, and the soils and the, and the grazing. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, had, I had brought some pictures with me and stuff and I met Gary Latch. Mm -hmm. And Gary was giving a talk. And that he was actually had a poster. It was one of the early days of posters, and he. Uh, so it was. I had a lot more time to talk to him, but it was on perennial ryegrass, and and he had the same problem with perennial ryegrass. It, there was a toxic, end, you know. Mm -hmm. We knew that there was an endophyte. We, it, it just that he had made big collections all over the world, and and had non toxic perennial ryegrass in the That's what he was reporting on. Mm -hmm. So I asked him, do you have tall fescue in the And he said he did. And I showed him my pictures and I said, I can tell you that I need in mm -hmm. but I don't want them toxic. Mm -hmm. And from there on, it just kind of, and the next step after about a year or so was me going to New Zealand mm -hmm. to try to set this project up mm -hmm. and, uh, and being on a sabbatical there. Mm -hmm. And actually, two things came out of that sabbatical. Uh, one was the non-toxic, non the Max-Q program, and, and then even Max-Q2. Once I got to Noble, that was one thing we did at Noble, even, was to continue the, with Noble. The Texoma Max-Q2 came out of the program. Mm -hmm. So it's a... Uh, and then the other one was uh, working with John Carolus and Derek Woodfield on, uh, on beefing up this thing called Durant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> getting their advice on what to do and mm -hmm. and that's how they approached their clover breeding and I had those I had that germplasm at that time you know mm -hmm. that we had collected all these ecotypes and so it was the two extremes but you know it's just something about that country mm -hmm. I know you've been there but you know it's just so forage oriented and yeah. so animal oriented and, and the people are just great and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very practical minded it was a great time mm -hmm. it was a great and the family Really loved it, yeah. Well, it strikes me that, you know, you've had an opportunity to kind of network. You talked earlier about working with people, but you've also networked with a lot of people around the world, and that right. is, the fruit of that really has been a lot of those accomplishments. Right. All into fight tall fescue and Durana being, mm -hmm. being one of those. You know, and I think being able to network like that, you, you have to have a certain amount of confidence about yourself, about your program, and, and what direction you're heading with that. How long was it before you kind of felt in your groove, How uh, before you felt comfortable in your position? After you came here to UGA, were you immediately just confident and knew what you were doing? and Or was it something that it kind of took a little time to build up to that point? Well, it definitely took some time. Uh, you know, as a f you, if you're brought in specifically, the other breeders are brought in as soybean breeders, or they're brought in as wheat breeders, or whatever. Uh, so uh, they, I was just brought in as a forage breeder. Well, you know, I would talk, Bill Sell was the extension guy in those days, and uh, Harold Brown, uh, Elvis Beatty was there, and then Glenn Burton down at Tifton, and Wayne Hanna, and you know, you talk to people and even meet extension agents. I, I mean, there were 32 crops I could have worked on. <laughs> so just just trying to figure out what the best ones were, and I, mm -hmm. I think I finally, I think before I tell you what our reasoning became, was mm -hmm. that we needed work on legumes for mm -hmm. sure. So that narrowed it down right away. Mm -hmm. And then uh, working with uh, working with alfalfa and, and clovers was just seemed the natural. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course, then we had the fescue toxicosis problem. So, mm -hmm. so we settled into that. But you know that, uh, you, you're a young guy and you're trying to, and, and people are telling you, you know, you're asking for opinions and, you know, you talk to two people and you get three opinions easy, you know. <laughs> so it, it just settling down to what you needed to do and, and, making the, and, and just making a choice and, and going with it. So that took a little while. So I'd say I was, uh, before I felt real comfortable, I was probably 15, 15 years into my program. And we had just released Alpha Grays and it was making a big splash. I had more than I ever dreamed it would mm -hmm. make. 
uh, and a lot of that was due to uh, Warren Thompson, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, from Kentucky. And Warren was a great champion of, mm -hmm. uh, of not only the variety, but also the process of mm -hmm. using alfalfa in a grazing situation. Mm -hmm. Now it's almost taken for granted. I mean, a lot of people graze yeah. alfalfas now, you yeah. know, and not before they alfalfa. wouldn't touch it, you yeah. know. Yeah. yeah, it's been interesting to see that transition. Even my yeah. time growing up on the farm, I, I remember alfalfas being exclusively a yeah. hay crop. But now it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's very expanded much the use. So what were some of the things that you absolutely loved about the job? What, what was your favorite thing about the job here at UGA or at Noble Foundation yeah. or some of the other things? Well, I think, I think it's the same in a general way that most scientists like. It's, it's a creative process. Mm -hmm. um, it might be very practical or it might be very basic, but, but it's a creative process. And I think, and as a plant breeder though, uh, when, when you'd see it all come to fruition in a variety and you see it being tested. And, uh, and the other one was, you know, when you go out and see 500 acres of it, you know, and a farmer's mm -hmm. telling you that it's really working real mm -hmm. well, that was really a heady time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, I think it's, it's all that, it's the creative process. And then as a plant breeder and as a variety developer, I should say, a cultivar developer, I, I, had, the, I, had, the, it, I had the luxury of actually See, being hired to develop cultivars because, you know, uh, the corn guys, they, they were going to rely on the industry mm -hmm. uh, to produce the hybrids. They might do some germplasm for them or whatever, but, but in the forage area, there was no real, except alfalfa, there were really no companies developing mm -hmm. varieties. So you were expected to develop varieties, to carry it to the final mm -hmm. thing. And, and that was good because uh, it just really gave you a rush to see it, you right. know, see what you had been trying to do have success, mm -hmm. so at all levels, yeah. Well, it's not all peaches and cream, right? There's always uh, right. some tough ta days. What are some of the things that you did to kind of blow off steam? What were some of your <laughs> hobbies that you uh, got involved with? Well, my, my, my children were real active in sports yeah. and in school, and uh, so I, I would uh, get involved you know, watching them, and sometimes in in the little league area, you know, I'd help coach and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, uh, I I enjoyed doing that. I always enjoyed uh, hunting and fishing. Mm -hmm. You know, didn't do as much of it as I'm doing now with my grandchildren, but uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've always enjoyed that. And we used to like to just like to travel, you know, mm -hmm. and and go places and see things. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that uh, sometimes it was work related. Mm -hmm. uh, but but it was it was always good to travel and and, mm -hmm. and 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 see new places and see new things. Yeah. Well, you mentioned we in that statement. I, yeah. You're you, this has not been solely you, right? I mean, <laughs> it been, definitely uh, has some not others been. Behind you, particularly your wife. How how important has your wife been oh, to this gosh, whole process? You know, uh, in fact, I mentioned Warren Thompson that. Uh, Warren and I used to laugh all the time that we both married way above ourselves, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and that's that's still true today. Uh, so yeah, you know it's 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 almost a cliche, you know that uh, oh yes I couldn't have done it, but but you know marriage to me is a team again. It's a it's a team, and mm -hmm. and uh, she she was a really good teacher, and so she taught school, and and also and, and but she stayed home with the kids. Till they got old enough and then she started teaching again mm -hmm. and you know it was just it's just a family thing and she one thing for sure though she doesn't suffer fools lightly <laughs> <laughs> so if i if i messed up or said something stupid <laughs> she would be the first person to point it out and, and a, a little known uh, backstory too uh, she's the one that named alpha graves really yeah i was uh, i was we were talking and I said, I got to come up with a name and I was putting names out, you know, uh, kind of key words like alfalfa, grazing, and everything. Mm -hmm. She said, well, look, I'll just call it alpha graze. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. <laughs> it was. It was very brilliant, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it's, you know, she was more than just a, mm -hmm. a, a, a researcher's wife. She, she actually was pretty active in it. And she was very critical, uh, too, of uh, some of our grazing trials. <laughs> when we were doing the... Uh, doing the uh, n novel fescues, you know, because we had to have the control group, mm -hmm. you know, and so they were on toxic fescue. Oh, yeah. That's pretty and, rough. And I'd stop by, we'd be going somewhere, and I'd swing by Edenton, and she'd get out, and she says, 
She said, man, you better hope the ASPCA doesn't, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't see what y'all are doing. I said, well, it's a control group, and we're going to bring them off before it gets real bad, yeah. you know. But, uh -huh. but uh, yeah, some of them in that heat of that Georgia yeah. uh, thing, they, they, can, they, they can look pretty rough out mm -hmm. there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you you mentioned kids as well. How many kids do you have? I have three children. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all grown now and doing well in their own lives. Uh, my oldest child was my daughter Melinda. She married a boy named Stephen Brown, and he's an orthopedic surgeon, and they live in Rome, Georgia. And she has three boys, mm -hmm. uh, three grandsons, Lawson, Connor, and Banks. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my middle son is uh, Andrew and uh, the middle, middle child, he's the oldest son, and he, uh, he's been in the financial area for a long time. He's a cor he lends corporate, makes corporate loans and mm -hmm. stuff like that, and, and he's, he's never been married, but he's engaged now to be married, so okay. we're all excited about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then my youngest boy, uh, Ben, he, he's in the, he actually sells orthopedic implants and doing mm -hmm. real well. His wife is uh, Christina, and they've got two children. Olivia and uh, Benjamin. Mm -hmm. So growing family and we're all close to each other mm -hmm. and uh, so we, uh, well, I mean we're close enough to see each other fairly regularly That's great. And, and get together. That's really great. Yeah. So of all the folks that you've interacted with, and I know it's going to be hard to kind of mm -hmm. narrow this down to one or just a handful anyway, but who, who would you credit the most for your success in your career? Well, you know, uh, you, you start I start with uh, Harold Brown when I first came to Georgia. He was a he had worked with Blazer. And mm -hmm. was a great, he he was a real well-renowned plant physiologist in his own right in the basic area of plant mm -hmm. physiology, not just crop physiology. Very bright. Guy. In fact, we still get together to this day. He was definitely a mentor, mm -hmm. my early mentor. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and you know, especially when I started my career. Of course, you you always have your major professor was Rex Smith and mm -hmm. and uh, and Al Dudek. I worked with Al a lot at Florida, but but uh, but Harold was my first true mentor. Then Carl came along, and uh, mm -hmm. Carl was a great mentor too, mm -hmm. Carl Hovland. Mm -hmm. uh, and and then of course working with McCann. So they they, they all had a uh, Mark McCann. They all had had influence on me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know. Uh, and then Warren Thompson, when we got into the commercialization aspect too, I mean, uh, he had a lot of faith in me. Brooks mm -hmm. Pennington did too. I, mm -hmm. Brooks, uh, we, 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 the first fescue we developed was Pennington. And they still sell in the fescues that we developed mm -hmm. today, the Jessops and the Max Qs and stuff. Mm -hmm. But so he, you know, it's, it's really simple. All these guys I mentioned, they had confidence in me. And you know, I, I, I was always puzzled by that, but you know, when people have confidence in you, it brings out your best. Yeah. It really does. Yeah. And for some reason, they saw something in me that I didn't even recognize myself, <laughs> you know? And uh, I, I'm sure my mother did, but I'm not sure, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about it. But, uh, but anyhow, uh, but again, when they had confidence in me and it brought out the best in me. Well, and success breeds success too. It I does, think. and you were able to yeah. build on those uh, early successes as well. So. It did. So, uh, kind of a closing thoughts here. You know, it's been said that uh, one shouldn't look for the meaning of life; mm -hmm. that one should just strive to live a meaningful life, and in the process, they'll discover what the meaning of their yeah, life really is. Very good. Is that something that kind of resonates with you? Do you feel it, like it does? I, I think it does. I, I think I think you try to live your life as well as you can all your whole life. Mm. Again, I was lucky to be surrounded by family and, and who I married and 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 the environment I worked in, the people I was around, where you know they were honorable. They were honorable people. Mm -hmm. uh, they did the right thing. It's it's uh, it's important, you know, that that you do the right thing in life, and and uh, and I think I think you finally you'll be rewarded for it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but looking back, I heard a line in a song the other day that I thought uh, was pretty interesting. It it said, uh, "The days are long, but the years are lightning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the years go by like lightning." Mm -hmm. You know, and and that's 
that's very, it's a Tanya Tucker song that I, I thought was very <laughs> interesting. But, uh, you know, as you look back now in this late in my career, that that's the way it feels now yeah. that yeah. I know there was a lot of long days. It seemed like every day was long, but then you look back and it would happen. How'd the years yeah. go, go by so fast? So quick, yeah. 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 Well, in closing, what what is one word that you would like for people to kind of know you as or know you for or associate mm -hmm. with you? What's one word that describes you? Uh, you know, just uh, hard work or, mm -hmm. you know, just stick to itness, you know, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, being consistent. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's probably the word I was trying to get out. I mean, all those others are, are important, mm -hmm. but, but I think it was just being consistent and staying mm -hmm. consistent. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we, we had go the goal, my goals, uh, I mentioned when I started at the University of Georgia of, of helping farmers and, and also, uh, deciding to bring legumes into the system and working on legumes, working on the tall fish cubes. We never changed that the mm -hmm. whole time. Even today, the consulting I do is amount around those crops. Mm -hmm. It's always it's been still, a mission, hasn't it? It's always been there, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think, I think consistency in this area builds, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you can build your reputation a lot more in consistency mm -hmm. than if you jump around a lot. Yeah, yeah. Well, I definitely can see that in your career you know, uh, throughout your career, you've had um, items or processes or, or uh, cultivars or releases that have come out that have consistently shown that, that focus back on real-world application back right. on the farm. So, Joe, it's been a pleasure doing well, this. I Dennis, really appreciate it's been my pleasure. I really appreciate you doing this.